Welcome to the Islam Unraveled podcast. We greet you with the traditional Muslim greeting of peace and blessings. Assalamu alaikum. On this podcast, we seek to help unravel the narratives surrounding Islam and Muslims in the West, as well as build bridges of understanding and friendship between cultures and communities. We acknowledge that our podcast is recorded on the traditional unceded territory of the First Nation peoples of BC. On this podcast, we encourage open discussion, and therefore the views expressed by our guests do not necessarily represent the views of Islam Unraveled. To support the work we're doing, please send your donations to finances at ihsan.ca. That's finances at ihsan.ca. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Councillor. And uh, this is uh, Councillor Christine Boyle of the City Council of Vancouver, the most beautiful city and the greatest city in Canada and the world, in my opinion. So thank you for, for joining us. And, and I wanted to, to, as we talked earlier before we started the interview, that uh, last I saw you was at the Vancouver Al Jamia Mosque uh, last year when you brought the proclamation from the city of Vancouver to commemorate uh, January 29th as, as, as a day of a memorial for the, the, the uh, attacks at the Quebec City Mosque. So we, we want to thank you again. Uh, on behalf of the city council for for that proclamation uh, from the mayor and the council. So thank you again. And please, if you wouldn't mind just talking about it, how all of that came together. Sure, I'm happy to. And it was an honor to get to uh, be the deputy role, uh, deputy mayor and uh, and read and present that proclamation and be part of a really um, incredibly moving uh, recognition uh, in in your community and to see the the diverse mix of faces who showed up um, and I'm always um, very happy to get to be inside the El Jamia mosque and be part of the uh, prayers and community that happened there um, so the uh, I'm sure you could say uh, um, more the proclamation came about through a motion to city council uh, and um, that motion was in line with calls across the country to formally recognize uh, uh, this date as a date of remembrance and recognition of Islamophobia um, and uh, and specific to uh, one terrible incident, of course, but but also I think in recognition of the the presence of Islamophobia uh, in day to day lives in cities and communities across the country that we can and should continue to uh, name and address in a whole myriad of ways, and that's certainly a commitment for me, a commitment for council, uh, for a lot of folks across the city, and so uh, it was an honor to get to present that. Uh, proclamation um, and also to get to do this work in an ongoing way with you and um, and your uh, listeners and followers and others across the city. Thank you, Christine. Thank you so much for that. And 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 you know, based on the relationship we've had with the city council, the city of Vancouver, and the mayor, and and previous administrations, there's been a lot of support for. Um, uh, just inclusivity and and fostering a sense of a community and equality and inclusivity, which uh, I, personally speaking for myself, I felt uh, great support and and the Al Jamia Mosque and and the Muslim community of Vancouver has always felt great support from the city. So maybe um, just for our listeners to introduce yourself and your background for those that may not be aware of of your background and how you came to public office and and join Kendi Stewart and the rest of your team to to uh, you know and and I actually met uh, the mayor uh, the day before the election he came and spoke to uh, to our congregation at the Al Jamia mosque and the next day who's the mayor so so uh, so yeah so interesting to to make all those connections but please introduce yourselves for the listeners that that may not be aware of your background and and the city council and your vision and the city's mission for for the greater Vancouver community Sure, happy to. So I, uh, this is my first term as a as a city councillor and um, in an elected office role. Uh, I come out of uh, community organizing and community work. I spent many many years working uh, in East Vancouver as a youth worker and in the downtown east side doing uh, outreach work there, um, and then doing 
uh, some climate work, work on uh, climate justice nationally. And actually my climate work was, uh, was multi-faith. So um, my, I, I sort of joke, my career path has been very winding much as I think my parents would have liked for me to become a doctor. I have had many, many jobs um, and I've learned a ton through all of it. And I'm really grateful to have had that path that's brought me to where I am. So I, um, uh, I was engaged in community work across the city and particularly with some of uh, the, uh, our neighbors in the city who are struggling most. Um, and uh, that work actually led me to a theological school. I studied down in the United States, down um, at the University of Berkeley, did a master's degree in religious leadership for social change. And I was very lucky down in California to get to study with a multi-faith group of students who were studying to be uh, ministers and rabbis and imams and Buddhist leaders uh, all together. Um, and then I came back to Vancouver. I, uh, I was ordained into the United Church of Canada as a minister, and I was working part-time um, at the Canadian Memorial United Church in Vancouver, and also doing national multi-faith climate work, helping faith communities look at their existing buildings and figure out how to make them uh, greener and more energy efficient in uh, buildings across the country. And at the same time was was involved in local issues, continued to be involved in the kind of uh, justice and housing uh, and inequality issues that I have been involved in for years in Vancouver. And that led me to being uh, asked by a number of people to run for council with a, a municipal party I've been involved in called One City Vancouver. Uh, and so I ran for office once to the elected myself and Jennifer Reddy uh, to the school board. And um, this council, as folks may or may not know, um, doesn't have a majority from any one party. So I've been working with my colleagues from uh, other parties and with the mayor who is an independent on all sorts of important issues. And I think for the most part, we as a council, uh, as you said, really share a commitment to addressing racism um, uh, and, creating a more welcoming community for everyone. And sometimes the way we think that should be done looks a bit different or the level of urgency we feel on it, but it is a shared commitment across the council. And we've been able to move the needle in a number of ways because of that commitment. Absolutely, I, I agree with you 100% uh, about uh, the city's commitment to inclusivity. I've seen it uh, time and time again. Now, you, we talked about racism and uh, and obviously we have a multi-racial, uh, multi-religious community and First Nations, uh, the Black community, um, uh, the Muslim community and, and and many others. And and just as you've done a lot of work uh, with, with other faith-based groups uh, as well as I have, and what was interesting, at least in in the work that uh, that 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 I had done in, in a faith based way uh, with with other uh, communities, was we found that uh, every group felt that they were the ones that were, um, I would say, discriminated against. Uh, so every everyone felt that that the prejudice uh, was directed mainly towards them per se. And I and I would meet a lot of the groups, and I'd be like you guys seem pretty mainstream to me, but, but it seems like there's a psychology, a human psychology where, where maybe the other. And so part of, uh, you know, even especially during the pandemic, we're not able to meet in person as communities to break bread. And, and really when people from other races and religious religions get together and meet and get to know one another, uh, because we live in such a multicultural, multiracial city, there's a level of, 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 of uh, brotherhood and sisterhood, understanding and, and community belonging. But because of um, the internet and kind of algorithms that kind of silo people to certain belief sets, so people's racial or religious identities are maybe reinforced and their beliefs about other groups are, are being reinforced by certain information that may not be accurate. And so dealing with that, and as a city, I'm sure there, there are challenges on a daily basis, but specifically about racism and, and cultural, like one, one incident because of the coronavirus, part of the learnings we've had um, uh, 
uh, with uh, RCMP hate crimes is that usually global events inform what happens to you on a day-to-day -day basis to people. And with the coronavirus, um, uh, Chinese and Asian uh, Canadians, were, uh, uh, there was a big spike in, in verbal abuse, physical abuse, uh, because for whatever reason, people would blame. Uh, I think it was 800%, the VPD said 800% increase in, 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 in race incidents, bias and, and attacks on, on people that have Asian or Chinese background. So dealing with that, how, how did the city respond? I'm sure you, the city's had so many challenges. This is like a, a historic year. So I'm sure we would, our listeners would love to hear how, how the city came at these challenges. Yeah, it's a great question. And the, um, as you outlined, the increase in, uh, in racially motivated hate incidents in Vancouver since the um, coronavirus hit has been uh, incredibly alarming. Um, I also think you outline well how that uh, connects to global events. You know, there's often some debate about whether or not the level of racism and white supremacy um, down in the United States uh, impacts us up here. Um, and, and I would say it certainly does in a myriad of ways. Um, and so those numbers are alarming. Um, and, and I think the flip side is that the huge public conversation that people have been having around racism, uh, in particular around anti-Black racism and the movement for Black lives, um, those are important learnings and, and really ground shifting conversations that have been happening here in Vancouver, uh, you know, tied to conversations and movements elsewhere as well. Uh, and the city is part of that learning. So the city, um, prior to this year, prior to the pandemic, had uh, been working on a strategy to address anti-Black racism, um, uh, as well as a strategy focused on Indigenous health and wellness, uh, both of which have come out of a lot of community advocacy uh, from residents uh, and, and organizations across the city, naming that we as the city need to do better on that work. Um, and we have uh, had for a number of years some very specific work in Chinatown looking at the transformation of Chinatown and the preservation of the cultural heritage that uh, exists across that neighborhood. So ongoing projects that, um, that preceded COVID and then the pandemic sort of stalled out a lot of that work because we were focused so intensely on um, managing the the impacts of the pandemic and particularly managing the impacts of the pandemic on our most vulnerable uh, neighbors and residents. Um, and in our city budget conversation that this last fall in December, um, uh, council in the city really recommitted to uh, doing that anti-racism work that we had underway already that got delayed a bit. So the anti-black racism work um, is, is back on the table uh, and we're back into it as well as looking at a broader anti-racism strategy that weaves together each of these specific pieces, you know, as I'm sure you know and your listeners know, uh, there's a value both in the, um, the broad work of addressing racism and hate and also the specifics of looking at what does uh, what does anti-Black racism look like? How does that impact our neighbors? Uh, who are Black in the city, and how do we specifically address that incarnation of uh, racism and hate, and similar uh, with anti-Asian racism. So we're trying to do both of those things, the high-level pieces um, and the on-the-ground pieces. Um, and I, I just want to lift up, as you mentioned too, I think the work that communities are doing in building those bridges among themselves is really important. So I too have spent years uh, doing um, interfaith and multi-faith work in Vancouver and more broadly. And, um, and I see how important those bridges are to be built, the relationships um, and the breaking down of barriers so that folks see one another. There are uh, a reminder I often find helpful is that it is hard to hate people up close. Uh, and so we should um, 
you know, not in a not in a time of social distancing, but otherwise we should invite one another in up close and hear those stories and see one another better and, and that that is the best uh, antidote to um, the kind of hate and despair that we see in other parts of the world and that we know exist here too. So I've been uh, delighted to have been able to do that multi-faith work. I, uh, I will say I miss it. Um, in fact, it's how uh, years ago, Haroon Khan and I were both on the board of the Interspiritual Center. Um, and so that was my first interaction with the Altamia Mosque was uh, in those relationships and they have continued over the years and it's been great to see all of the work um, around homelessness, around uh, providing food that the community has done. So amplifying those stories, bringing people together, I think that's the community piece of the work. And then we as the city are doing um, some systemic work uh, at the city level and the province is certainly engaged as well and everybody doing their part I think is what this urgent moment requires. Agreed, agreed and uh, as you know with Haroon and El Jamia Mosque and, and the rest of our team, uh, El Jamia uh, Masjid Vancouver has been uh, at the forefront uh, to, to really reach out and, and with Islam Unraveled, which is the outreach uh, uh, to other communities. Um, I will say um, uh, after what happened in Quebec City, uh, the outpouring of people from Vancouver that came to the mosque of their own, like they came with candles, with, with flowers, with cards, tears in their eyes I, I i was moved i was emotionally moved really it was a life-changing experience for me that i i, I really mm -hmm. really to how people care just about their fellow human beings uh, regardless of race or religion was it was an impactful event uh, specifically on me um i can't speak for anybody else but i was i was very moved and then at the jack pool plaza there's a, a larger a memorial where, where thousands of people and it was a blizzard there was like snow it was cold uh, yet people came just for for a couple three hours, really making their time to 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 come out. And I thought, what a great city! What a what an amazing uh, set of values that that it, and it was across every race and religion. So we we had rabbis come, we had ministers come, we had congregation, we had non-religious people come, and it was it was amazing. And and what what it, what it kind of brought to mind was our, our uh, Vancouver values and the city of Vancouver, like moving forward, like issues about homelessness and addiction. And part of um, uh, what we as a Muslim community uh, all came together uh, to establish the Muslim Care Center. And it was many team members from many mosques, many Islamic organizations to do public work uh, that's identifiable, identifiable that Muslims are actually out in vulnerable communities like the downtown east side and where our locations on Main and Hastings and uh, seven days a week throughout the pandemic we've been uh, giving food uh, recently we did um, uh, blankets and socks and and various other needful items for for folks that are uh, sleeping in parks and what have you so we, we've done that with other Muslim organizations and so part of uh, the thought process with all the Muslim organizations coming together that, that we are uh, shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters of other faiths and other races, other races, and and the problems that you've seen personally in your previous work and your current work on the downtown east side, it, it takes a village, it takes a city, it takes everybody to, to work together to, to help one another. And so uh, what we did find was we found even several, a uh, couple hundred Muslims that, that were on the downtown east side uh, that had mental health problems, uh, drug addiction problems, uh, amongst other people that had uh, the, the, these issues. And so, uh, so an expression of, I would say, uh, what happened from Quebec City eventually evolved into this community work in, in a broader way. Haroon, he was the one that initially did, it was called uh, uh, Ramadan Spirit. So at the end of Ramadan, uh, Haroon would host uh, from the Al Jamia Mosque and bring a lot of folks together to to give uh, a, a lot of different meal items uh, at the end of Ramadan, and so a continuation of the care center was 
to do that every day. <laughs> and so, so because the problem is not just one day, it's like seven days a week and, and food is one part. So uh, I realize uh, with the city council, with the mayor, um, the, the homeless uh, crisis, uh, addiction uh, problems in our communities are significant. And so strategies that the city has, the council, I'm sure you've had many discussions regarding that, um, what are what are the current uh, strategies and plans to to help address this issue? Yeah, um, it's a great question, and I just want to say it's such an incredible story. I think um, of the the way that you have turned grief from um, the Quebec City massacre into this gift uh, to others in the community is is so powerful and I have known it, but hearing you um, say it again is really moving. And uh, I think a valuable story uh, to amplify more broadly for folks, you know, in the, in the spirit of better understanding each other, I think that grief into a gift is, um, is so powerful for us all. So absolutely the city uh, is, uh, and council is talking about um, and wrestling with the, the challenges that our, our city and our neighbors face around uh, homelessness and addiction, um, which, which is a, a problem that's been escalating for you know, decades really. Um, and so uh, it's not new during COVID, but it certainly is the case that it's become more visible during COVID um, because of uh, how many spaces have been closed down, how many um, people have fewer options and are spending more time outside. Um, you know, in this sort of specific example on that front, um, I, I also sit on the public library board, the board of the Vancouver Public Library, and we're conscious uh, of how many folks used libraries as a space during the day where they didn't have somewhere else to go and used library washrooms um, as public washrooms where they didn't have other washrooms to access. And when libraries were closed during the early parts of the pandemic, those folks lost uh, that space. And so we did see more people out in streets and parks um, more people who had nowhere uh, to use a washroom with dignity and so were having to use um, bushes and outdoor spaces and um, and I, I mean that that's a horrible situation for anyone to be in to not have a place uh, where they can um, uh, can use a washroom so I think it both um, it made more visible to a lot of our residents the uh, the poverty that exists in the city, the inequality that exists. Um, it also made more visible the huge role that those public institutions like libraries, like our community centers and other public services play um, in this city. Uh, and it has amplified uh, the need and the call for um, more uh, truly affordable welfare rate housing, um, as well as stronger mental health supports. You know, I think even those of us uh, who don't um, publicly wrestle with mental health uh, uh, diagnoses have, uh, have had a harder time, I will say, you know, I have two kids at home, the level of stress in our home um, has increased over the pandemic. Um, and we have otherwise all sorts of supports in place. So uh, for folks in the city who don't have all of those supports, who were already struggling day to day, the added pressure of this pandemic has really pushed a lot of people um, uh, further down in, uh, in their mental health struggles. So the challenge for us as a local government is that the solutions um, in terms of housing and in terms of mental health supports uh, are historically largely not in our jurisdiction. And I'm very cautious to not seem like I'm passing the buck. The city uh, can and should play a role in these answers, but we also need um, the provincial and federal government to show up in a more serious way. So we've been hearing um, the province, uh, the provincial government has been more active at the table in talking about uh, welfare rate housing and affordable housing. Um, and we need the federal government, quite frankly, to show up to the table in a much more serious way 
on that front too. Historically, housing has been a federal uh, has been a federal mandate, and partly that's because uh, people move around the country, of course. So um, folks who are homeless in Vancouver aren't all from Vancouver, though many of them, their last uh, address, the last place, place they paid rent was in Vancouver. Um, but it's a provincial issue, it's a federal issue, and so we need those levels of government as well. And um, this council has been yelling and screaming um, to try to get those partners to the table so that we can more adequately address these challenges because we know the solutions, you know, the solutions aren't magic, the solutions uh, are, are known, they are housing, um, supportive housing, uh, and, you know, a, a better range of mental health supports as well as a safe supply of drugs so people aren't forced to, to uh, use access an illegal and toxic drug supply so that they can stay alive long enough to access the types of care and treatment that they need. All of these solutions are known and we, uh, we desperately need to be um, tackling them at a much faster rate. And so one of my roles on council is to uh, advocate on all of those fronts. And another role is to uh, keep acting in terms of what the city can do. This council um, recently put $30 million into uh, immediate housing solutions. And uh, we've been working on rolling those out as quickly as we can with the you know, practical logistics of getting buildings in place, whatnot, but we wanted to say, this is how seriously we're taking this and we need uh, our senior government partners to uh, to step up as well. So, um, so all of that uh, is actively underway and also needs to be done, you know, a hundred times more and a hundred times faster. And, uh, and that's what I sit with and wrestle with and lose sleep over every single day. And 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 I commend you and and the team of the city council and the mayor for for the focus and dedication because there's a multi pronged initiative and it requires the province and the federal government uh, as a team it, the resources have to come but the city does allocate resources and so we were um, last week we were giving uh, on the park on Venables I forget the name of it where uh, the uh, tenants Strathcona Strathcona Strath Park Strathcona. So we were there and, I, and and then I was like, I think I read in the newspaper or, or on an online article, the city actually works to try and provide housing like like there is housing. So why would some people like I know in a previous discussion I had with with other members of, of city council years ago, they were saying that sometimes there are certain issues that people have pets or they have uh certain mental health issues for whatever reason, or they have other companions that uh what are the what are the barriers between folks uh, that choose to remain in tents uh, to to not avail of some of the the housing the city is trying to provide? Um, what are those barriers? That's a great question. Um, as you'd expect, there are a whole range of them. So uh, sometimes the barriers are the housing that we can make available isn't um, doesn't feel to people like a better option, and uh, so. Uh, a portion of the shelter rate, truly affordable housing in the city is single room occupancy hotels. Um, sometimes they're they're publicly run or they're run by nonprofits. Um, sometimes they're privately run. Uh, the conditions of some of those hotels are uh, pretty deplorable. Um, the the rooms don't lock. The washrooms uh, are plugged and don't work. Um, the other residents in the building uh, may be wrestling with their own demons and be uh, be loud in their rooms with very thin walls. Um, there are uh, there are often bed bugs or other uh, rodents. Some of these buildings um, are uh, are very inhumane. Um, and and I will say that a decade ago that I was working uh, in the downtown east side, I visited. Uh, many people in many SRO hotels, um, and it was uh, it was not an acceptable living standard um, that some of these uh, hotels operate in. So I think there are certainly folks living in tents in our parks who have lived in SROs, um, and 
uh, and would rather live in a tent than go back to one of those rooms, um, particularly in the, the summer months in Vancouver. You know, I'll add the other, one of the other things I hear about the SRO rooms is just how cold they get in the winter because of draftiness and the lack of heat and how stiflingly stuffy and hot they get in the summer. So also for folks with um, any kind of chronic health issues, they can be, um, they can be quite unhealthy places to be. So people choose may choose tents for that reason. Like you said, uh, often people with pets who are a you know a, a pretty key part of their support uh, system uh, may not be allowed into these buildings. Um, often uh, rooms, a private room with a door, isn't even available, and so the housing options that are available, unfortunately, are simply shelter beds in congregate settings, so a shelter bed in a, in a large shelter. And again, um, even outside of the pandemic, for a lot of people uh, with, uh, you know, past trauma, they're trying to heal um, with mental health struggles. That's not a preferable or a safe option. Um, and then the reality of the pandemic has meant that uh, people have concerns about being in group settings like that because of COVID. Um, and also uh, the number of beds has been decreased because they've been spaced out over those shelters. Um, so it is the case that uh, there are a number of buildings that are SROs uh, run by nonprofits uh, or the city that are in good shape, but they're full because we don't have enough of those beds. Um, there are people who choose shelters and lately our shelter beds have been full too because we have fewer of them because of COVID restrictions. Um, and so, so sometimes people have another choice and they're choosing to stay in a tent and sometimes they don't have another choice because you know the choice is not viable for them or it's just not there because um, there aren't enough, uh, there aren't enough units, there aren't enough beds. And so uh, all of those are the struggle we are, um, uh, have been looking at how we better uphold standards of maintenance to make sure that existing SRO rooms are uh, up to a certain, you know, acceptable and healthy standard. Um, and the city, uh, it's been in the news over the last couple of years, the city expropriated a couple SRO buildings that were so dangerous and decrepit that they um, could, were not habitable anymore. Uh, and so now we're in the process of figuring out with the province how we uh, repair or, or hopefully tear down and rebuild those buildings uh, to replace those units, but in um, a much more supportive and livable way. Um, and in the meantime, emergency shelter beds uh, and, and temporary modular housing and all of that, I mean, all of these options continue to be on the table and, and we're sort of scrambling for everything that we can do uh, all at once. There's no one solution. And um, a friend of mine, Karen Ward, who's a, a drug advocate, drug policy expert in the downtown east side, um, often highlights how important it is for people to feel that they have a choice, not just to say, rather than where you are, here's the one other place you can go. But, you know, it's important for all of us. And, uh, and so it's important for uh, our neighbors who are homeless too, to feel like they have some agency in, uh, in their own healing, in their own housing. Um, and so options um, matter for people so that uh, they, uh, they take them up and they, um, uh, they feel like they can take care of themselves and have a say in, in their future. And, and earlier in the discussion, we talked about uh, discrimination and racism. And, and I would say the homeless community is a vulnerable uh, community that does uh, sometimes in, in when, when I do talk about the downtown east side, people that have never been there and don't understand the stories of the people, there's a, there's a lack of sympathy. And then when I the one story that I know that that really touched me was, you know, a father, um, uh, his, his son had passed away and, and he went into a deep depression, alcoholism and drugs, and then he wound up on the downtown east side. So I'm a father as well. So when somebody has that kind of traumatic loss and, and you know, human beings are human beings, he's self-medicating, whatever it was, he didn't intend to wind up 
on the downtown east side. So just, you know, for, for our listeners and people in general, human beings, right? People are, are human beings. Everyone's a, a son, a daughter, and they come from somewhere. There's a story. There's something that happened. So whether it's a physical disability, whether it's a, a mental health issue, a traumatic event in their life, uh, maybe a sexual assault, something has happened that, that, that has created uh, this sort of... Uh, uh, situation where where people will resort to to drugs or or alcohol or these situations because uh, for whatever reason they're not able to cope with with the day to day because of certain stressors and so the human aspect uh, let's let's talk about some human stories obviously confidentially in mind but I'm sure you've come across certain situations you understand anecdotally the human component of people there that are struggling so people can understand they're human beings yeah it, i mean the amount of trauma that people are wrestling with and and trying to heal um is immense um the the other aspect i would add is the layers of intergenerational trauma in the downtown east side from uh, residential schools and before that from um, the impacts of colonization in Canada uh, uh, all are part of why we see larger numbers of Indigenous folks living in the downtown east side um, as well as ongoing impacts of, uh, of racism against Indigenous communities. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's so important and actually just listening to you speak to that makes me think back to our conversation 20 minutes ago about the value um, in interfaith work of bringing people together across bridges to hear one another's stories and it is uh, the reality in Vancouver that we have um, huge amounts of wealth and we have huge amounts of poverty and uh, and I think you're right that for a lot of residents across the city, um, they haven't had a chance to, to move in up close and hear those uh, human stories of, uh, of people's lives as they, um, as they wrestle with uh, homelessness or with addiction or with uh, layers of trauma and uh, a need for healing. Um, and hearing those stories, I think, bring people uh, together with more empathy and more willingness to bring about solutions. There there has been, um, I've been troubled in the last number of months by a kind of rise in, in some publicly expressed sentiment that is sort of um, uh, anti-homeless people, anti-drug user, like a, a pretty, um, I'm wrestling as you can tell with how to say this, but uh, a real lack of compassion in how people see those who are so visibly struggling in our neighborhoods. Um, and uh, we have work to do on that front because um, that stigma uh, makes the situation worse for everyone. Um, and it certainly makes it harder to bring about uh, the solutions that we need, including, you know, we can't just build affordable housing, more affordable housing in the downtown east side. Uh, this is a citywide problem. and. I have spoken a lot about the need to build um, supportive uh, shelter rate housing in neighborhoods all across the city because my experience working in the downtown east side, the stories I hear are that there are many people for whom that's their home neighborhood and they would like to uh, find housing there. And there are many other people who would like to uh, move out of the neighborhood who would find it easier to, uh, to get back on their feet with some space and distance away from some of the triggers um, that they might experience in that neighborhood. And so we need both of those options available for people. And that means building more supportive housing in other neighborhoods of the city and increasing stigma about mental health or drug use or uh, homelessness makes it harder to build that housing um, in each of our neighborhoods. And so all of these things uh, connect to one another. and. Um, and again, I think, as you've said, that the need to see one another, to humanize those stories and those struggles uh, matters a lot. Um, and again, that's something we can play a role in as elected officials. Um, and uh, it's, it's equally powerful to see it happening 
um, from community leaders like yourself uh, who, who uh, reach far beyond my reach and can help uh, break down those, that stigma and those barriers. And, 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 and yeah, even as you said, discrimination and prejudice um, to homeless uh, people that, that, that are homeless. So people, when they hear homeless, they don't look at people and individuals. They just think, oh, they choose to be like that. And then I was, so this is a big learning I had. Some people think when somebody's addicted to drugs and alcohol, uh, it's their choice. And I was like, once somebody's addicted, it is a mental health issue. It, it's not like you have a choice when you're addicted. And so I've had these debates with certain people that, again, have a, a certain bias because they don't know the ramifications. Again, nobody intends to become an addict or nobody intends to become homeless, but addicts become discriminated against and uh, homeless becomes discriminated against because people don't know the context of what happened, that individual story. And there's a lack of sympathy because people don't know those stories. And, and when the city does provide these things for the safety of the people, which is safe injection sites, uh, needle exchange, all these sorts of things, there's a, a tendency from people to think, oh, why is the city uh, you know, doing that? They're, they're exacerbating the problem, but that's they're trying to provide the safety of the people because if it's not done and and this was uh, i was at uh, uh it was an interfaith leaders group uh to talk about homelessness so there there was a lot of statistics that if the city doesn't help that one individual the cost to society the actual dollar cost to the society is much more than if the city didn't invest in trying to help the people so left unchecked left left to go as is without providing those helps, just the economic impact is manifold by not actually helping, whereas the city's actually saving the society from much bigger costs by, by addressing these issues. So I know we've unpacked a number of, of kind of things here, but but please do, like just, just from that addiction standpoint, the stigma of addiction and then the economic cost. Yeah, the studies that have been done on the economic impact, I think, um, are fascinating. And I appreciate how those, you, you know, each of us are swayed a bit differently by different arguments. And so um, for those for whom that is a compelling case, I'm glad to have those uh, numbers. And as you say, it is um, very clearly the case that it would be more fiscally responsible. Um, uh, it, it, would, it would cost less for us to house people and provide the health supports that they require um, than our current patchwork system, which relies very heavily on, um, uh, on policing, um, on emergency room use, and a, a kind of, uh, rather than preventative healthcare and supports, uh, an emergency healthcare response, um, the way that we are responding to these crises is, uh, is makes no sense if the goal is fiscal responsibility. We really should be um, supporting uh, people more proactively in uh, all of the ways that they need. Um, and I will say, you know, well, as I said, I find that compelling as a, um, as a person of faith, the, the moral argument for me is, um, is what pulls at me, which is that of course, uh, each, of our neighbors, each other human deserves the chance to uh, live and stay alive for as long uh, as they need to find healing and wellness and uh, and and get back on their feet, as they say. So um, that's the pull for me to uh, harm reduction, um, to supporting overdose prevention sites. Um, uh, as well to advocating for safe supply and a decriminalization of drugs. We, we see that the systems we have set up right now are failing people, both in terms of the overcriminalization that leads people into this um, spiral of the justice system and further uh, addiction and struggle. Um, it's also failing people because the drug supply right now is so toxic that people, uh, People are dying um, just trying to self-medicate, just trying to meet this habit where they, they don't need to die um, if there were clean drugs uh, available. Um, 
And if we weren't so set on, in a kind of moral way, punishing the use of certain drugs, um, then they could uh, access what is what is for many people, as you said, a form of self-medication for trauma. Um, they could access a, a clean enough drug that they weren't at risk of dying um, and keep doing so until uh, they found other supports as well to um, uh, to patchwork their own healing and, and for us to provide a better uh, system of support. You know, there are lots of drugs in our culture that we have legalized um, and condone. Uh, and um, I have no doubt that if there were a poisoned, uh, you know, batch of beer out there, that there would be a, a strong response um, in by government, by health authorities. Uh, but we have, as, as part of a kind of othering and distance, decided that some drugs are, are morally bad, um, and uh, we haven't responded adequately um, because of that to care for the folks who are literally dying um, in the thousands uh, because of that. So, I mean, that's all of these, um, all of these avenues into support for uh, housing and safe supply matter. And I, um, and I uh, am hopeful that more and more people get to that place of support. Um, and for me, that's the piece that is most compelling is just the dignity, uh, the dignity and worth of every human being. Uh, and that includes human beings who, uh, who use drugs, that includes humans who have, uh, you know, have more visible demons and, and mental health issues. Um, each of those lives uh, is important. And, and I think we should be doing all we can to make sure that they stay alive and receive the supports that they need to live a kind of whole and um, healthy life. And, and uh, agreed. And that's my I, preaching. Sorry, that's sort of not my yeah. less my politician had and more my minister had. I couldn't. Well, I, 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 I think we, we have our, um, our our respective kind of heartfelt desire to help our community and I'll, I'll share with you one story uh, yes. one of our one of our community um, again he was addicted uh, to opioids and he was on the downtown east side um, uh, shooting up on the surface if anyone would have seen him in you know objectively people that don't have uh, the experience that you have or, or a, to a, a lesser degree myself like it, people would have not no sympathy per se but I will say he's now come out of it he's been able to and i think it's a holistic multidisciplinary where it's the, the 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 government supports the city supports the community supports even the faith based supports because a human being is many things it's not just food it's not just counseling it's, it it requires the whole society from the government to the private sector to the faith based communities and all the resources to help everybody so this individual uh, again, deep in addiction, family problems, uh, lost his job, lost lost his home, and uh, and then you know through the twelve step program, AA, NA, and community help, and now he's an advocate going out. So he he basically re he, he was somebody on the downtown east side. Maybe people could drive by and have some sort of you know whatever prejudicial thought about this person but I have so much respect for him because not only is he recovered but he's now going to find others that that are that are in addiction to help them join the the 12-step program and 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 just a lot of respect that that although he 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 fell down but he's now through the collective work of what he's doing the community support uh getting back on his feet and contributing to society and I would say uh, a lot of the people down downtown, you know, some are, are very educated. Some have multiple talents and, and abilities that, that people are unaware of. It's just like prejudice and racial discrimination sees a color in a religion and makes uh, a judgment. And the term homeless or addict evokes another judgment that people have. But again, human beings are human beings until you get to know, understand the people, meet the people. That's what's going to create a level of desire within all of us to say, hey, you know what? We have to help 
everybody from every facet of society. And that's my soapbox, <laughs> like, because I've seen it work on that one individual, how all these supports came. And, and now he, in my view, is, 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 is someone uh, I have hold it in great respect uh, for, for what he's been able to accomplish from where he went. And I think there's many people like that, but if we don't help or if we just ignore it or we criticize, it's, it's, it's not going to solve anything. And, and, and really uh, the power of human beings is powerful that with the right holistic support, some, some of those, some of the people can be even much better contributors to society th than we are. And yeah, so that's what I mean, I, I will hear, uh, uh, allow me to be just a tiny bit theological also, which is like it gets to, I have such a deep belief in, um, in the possible redemption of everyone, like that every single person has um, within them an incredible amount of worth and wisdom that, uh, that we can and should find a way to lift up and support, not just that some people um, might be able to recover, but that um, were we to create the kinds of systems that uh, that are possible and that people deserve, that that every single person has that in them. And as you highlight so um, well in your example, that that all of us have a, a an incredible amount to learn from. Um, people who use drugs, from people who are homeless or have been homeless, um, and all of those voices should be a more central part of, for, for policymakers and decision makers like me, should be at the table and should be, um, should be informing the types of decisions that we make because uh, they know what will work and they know what that struggle looks like in the deep depths of it, and those lived experiences should be uh, informing how we uh, how we respond, and I think governments have been doing a better job um, of seeking out those voices and healthcare systems as well. But there's still a ways to go because the kind of gap between who's in leadership positions and who knows on the ground these uh, these struggles most acutely um, it is still a gap, and so. Um, the the story you lift up is so important in the um, the role that folks uh, with with these lived experiences play in helping the rest of us both better understand the specifics of the situation and kind of find more of our own humanity in the story and humanity of uh, of someone that we might have written off. Um, so and, just uh, yeah, really grateful for that story. And every time I get to um, hear stories uh hear stories like that and 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 even this form in, in our discussion with you be, being able to press uh your work that you've been doing prior to being in office being in office i think uh even in our community to hear from you because you are a policy maker you are a decision maker you are in government and so um you know this this type of a forum to to understand what the city is doing and what what individuals like yourself in the leadership role have this uh, this mission as well to 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 help the greater good. So um, with our audience in the Muslim community uh, uh, for this dialogue to to be able to at least uh, let our community know the city's working with us um, about Islamophobia and and these items, but also these other greater societal issues. And, and I'm sure there's many other topics we could discuss, but limiting it to, to, to kind of where, where we're talking about uh, racism, discrimination, as it applies to, again, faith or religion or race, but also as it applies to vulnerable people that have mental health addiction and homeless, which are discriminated against. And we are collective brothers and sisters in humanity, uh, different faiths, different beliefs. But but again, we're, we, we, have, we have this desire to help our community. If we help our community, we help our families. That it's just, we protect others, we, but, and we respect our, we, we protect our families and we protect ourselves. So it's it, it really almost is a way of our own internal um, kind of uh, sense that I am contributing to society, but by helping others is actually even helping myself. So it's almost self-serving to a degree. But, uh, but just to wrap up our discussion, um, 
uh, I, I want to thank you again and the city for the proclamation to join us at this coming event on January 29th, um, just to remember uh, members of our community that were in Quebec City that were killed because they they were Muslims and uh, they were praying, right? So again, prayer in, in all our face and praying to God uh, for the various reasons we pray. Um, and in this memorial is just to, again, showcase uh, leaders like yourself. We have the defense minister, Harjit Sajjan, who's gonna speak, um, the minister of inclusivity and diversity, Bardis Chugger, um, uh, the VPD hate crimes, uh, RCMP hate crimes, uh, the parliamentary secretary, um, Rasha Singh um, uh, on anti-racism. So we have multiple speakers, Haroon and uh, Mufti Asim and uh, Bilal Chima, a lot of our community members. And, and again, uh, this collective work, Islam Unraveled, the Muslim Care Center, there's so many people in our team that, that do much more than I do. I'm just grateful to be part of the team uh, and grateful that I'm at least uh, a voice to communicate with government, uh, with yourself, to, to share our respective stories and our respective work together and, and looking forward to continuing our work beyond what's already happened. And hopefully uh, tomorrow and the day after, uh, our societies and our cities get better and better with the collective work we're doing. And, and please do in closing any final comments for the Muslim community, for the listeners uh, from the city and yourself. Just a, um, a huge and heartfelt uh, thank you for the, um, the work that you do, um, for the work that the Muslim Care Center does do, for all the um, volunteers. I know all of this doesn't happen without kind of layers and layers of uh, volunteers and, um, and mutual aid and support. It's really stood out to me during this pandemic. Um, I think a lesson we've all learned about how interconnected our lives are, um, how interdependent we are. And so uh, I, I am just full of gratitude for um, everything that you do um, and the spaces that you create and the bridges that you uh, built that help us um, all become um, more human and, and see more of our own humanity. So I'm glad for this conversation. I look forward to the day when we can sit in a room together and I would uh, welcome the opportunity to hear um, uh, from from more folks uh, in the congregation and uh, and in your um, many networks uh, to get to just listen and hear stories and get to better know people uh, seems like a, a dream to me and I look forward to when we're allowed to do that again and um, in the meantime grateful for this uh, for this online conversation. Yeah, I'm very thankful as well on our end and, and would love to invite you and other members of City Council uh, to come to the Muslim Care Center. I know Councillor uh, Jean Swanson had come visit, uh, to visit us, I think, last year. And, uh, you know, with, with some of our team like Sharina Khan and others that, that do a lot of great work, we'd love to introduce you to the rest of the team uh, when the uh, pandemic uh, hopefully uh, whenever the, the restrictions are lifted and we'd be a great honor for you uh, and other members who would like to come to, to join us and meet the rest of our team. I will happily um, work with you to set that up and, and invite the rest of council too. Thank you so much. Thank you very yeah. much. For Thank you all. Nice to talk to you. Thank you for listening to the Islam Unraveled podcast. To learn more about our programs, please visit us on Facebook or at www.islamunraveled.ca. We'll see you next time.